Welcome back. Today, we're gonna to answer a question that the media has bandied about since the beginning of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that is, is Russia gonna run out of troops? Stick around and find out. At the beginning of the war, the Russians invaded Ukraine with a tremendous amount of combat power. Based on several different estimates, Russia entered the conflict with a total of between 209,000 and 224,000 forces. Now, 34,000 of those forces were scattered between the Ukrainian elements in the LPR and DPR militias. Additionally, the Russians had a separation between the armed forces and what they call their Federal National Guard troops, which are more like a constabulary formation. If you look at that, the Russians had a total of uh, between 175,000 and 190,000 troops that went in. Of that number, about 142,000 were Russian military proper forces, and then another 33,000 to 48,000 were those constabulary formations. So they went in with a tremendous amount of combat power. That said, no one seems to agree on what the quote unquote burn rate is of Russian formations over the last five to six months in Ukraine. However, there are plenty of estimates. So at the low end, the Russians, which provided their only estimate in the very beginning of the war, in the March timeframe, and they only gave their uh, number of KIA. And let me step back really quickly. When you're talking about casualties, you're talking about wounded in action and killed in action. And just for folks who are watching this video, when I go through this analysis, I'm just assuming that anybody who's wounded in action can't be sent back to the front. Now, that's not necessarily the fairest of analyses, but I don't have data to, to suggest things one way or the other. That said, the Russians are gonna get plenty of mulligans in further areas of my analysis as we proceed through the video, as you'll see. So you know, given those numbers, there's only one estimate that actually provided both wounded in action and KIA, and that was the US government. And the other piece of information that I'm using and applying across all the scenarios is that you know, that same estimate had an implied number for the, for the ratio of killed to wounded in action. And that ratio was for every KIA, three soldiers were wounded in action on the Russian side. Now that's a pretty high ratio for the past two decades, US forces uh, had a much lower ratio, something on the order of uh, for every KIA, there were nine wounded in action. Uh, you could find that statistic in The Economist magazine. But in this sort of situation, given the failure on the Russian military side to adequately prepare and plan to provide adequate logistics for this operation so as a data point Russian soldiers were running out of food you know four days into the conflict which is complete and utter incompetence you know, given that it's not surprising that the medical care of troops at the front is not anywhere near approaching Western standards so I think a ratio of one to three is probably pretty accurate, and I have applied that consistently throughout. Now, it will cause some problems with my analysis. So on the Russian side, obviously, for 1351 that they provided at the very beginning of the conflict in March, that would imply total casualties on the order of 5,000 throughout at least that particular time period. Whereas if you apply it to what the Ukrainians are saying that the Russians lost, you get a number that is uh, larger than what the number of armed troops, armed forces troops that the Russians went into 
into Ukraine with, which is, I mean, it's possible, but it's highly, highly unlikely. So, and to be fair, they only provided a number of uh, KIA, and I just extrapolate what the wounded is. You know, maybe that maybe that ratio is lower. I have no way of knowing, so I just blindly applied it across the board. Now, I do have a spreadsheet that you can get by you know clicking in the comments below that I'm selling as as part of this, and I'm selling it at an extremely steep discount, a 90% discount. So, if you're kind of a data nerd and want to play with these numbers, feel free to grab a copy of it. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is given that these estimates were provided by different sources at different times, the way that I'm performing the analysis is I'm assuming that the casualty rate is constant or has been constant for the fi first five months of the war, which is not accurate. It's going to end. It's going to ebb and flow throughout the war based on different operations and tactical pauses like the Russians had a few weeks ago where those casualty rates would go down a little bit and then they would spike during high intensive military operations. But what I'm assuming in this analysis is they kind of steady out over that period of time. So again, I'm applying these numbers, you're going to see some results on the the extremes that might not make sense, and they also don't make sense, won't make sense for a reason. So the Ukrainians have every incentive to inflate the number of Russian casualties, while the Russians have every incentive to minimize the number of their casualties. And it's obvious in the data. You'll see, uh, you can see, you can see, you know, over my shoulder or whatever I have it posted here. You can see from the chart that. At the very bottom, the Russians are reporting the lowest number and the Ukrainians are reporting the highest number. Regardless, what you're seeing here is, you know, there are estimates between 180 casualties a day at the, on the Russian side to over 1,000 casualties a day for what the Ukrainians are reporting, the Russians are losing. Now, the American government, the White House and CIA, are reporting something a little bit more sensible, something between 400 to 500 losses a day. So as you're going through this analysis, that's probably the more realistic number. So the, you know, that's where we are today. Those are the numbers. Now, there's also a lot of anecdotal data from both sides about what Russian morale looks like. and from recruitment posters and things like that that folks have seen in Russia, we're seeing offers of multiples of the average salary to get tankers and other Russian, the Russian equivalent of a military occupational specialty into the fight. And obviously it's very difficult to recruit Russians into the tanking profession, for instance, given the horrific losses and the fact that the Russians are having to bring in T-62 tanks, which are extremely, extremely old model, into the conflict because of the losses, the extremely high losses at the very beginning. And the other piece is there's also a lot of anecdotal data that with the spring 2020 conscription target of 134 and a half thousand troops, that the Russian recruiters are, are having, or at least, I don't, I don't know if you call them recruiters, but Russian authorities are having a lot of difficulty trying to get their quota. So again, I've seen anecdotally between 60 to 70% of target in some places as low as 30% in other particular provinces and regions. So my analysis assumes that the Russians, you know, as they go forward, are able to get the full 134 and a half thousand. Is that realistic? Probably not. But the fact is, it's been very hard to recruit people right now in Russia and in the to join the military. Additionally, there's also a lot of indiscipline in the ranks. There's been anecdotal data of in Kherson of Russians trying to, Russian soldiers trying to 
hide in civilian clothing to avoid the devastating artillery strikes by the Ukrainian military. Whether or not that's true, I can't verify it, so it likely comes from the Ukrainian side, take it with a grain of salt. On the Russian side, they're posting videos on Telegram of, of Russians dancing, Russian soldiers dancing and having a great time. Um, again, that could, it's probably also true, but you know, if if the Russian military is the same as it was, or similar as it was during the Great Patriotic War in World War II, uh, they used to get a vodka ration. Chances are they probably still get a vodka ration because they certainly need it. So these are some of the factors. And then and the last factor that I mentioned on a prior podcast is that the Russian contractors like Wagner are recruiting prisoners. So that reflects a certain level of desperation that you know could could indicate that Russian authorities are are getting a little bit desperate. But are they getting desperate? Are the Russians running out of troops? Now the other area that should be really concerning for Russian authorities is the Russian population pyramid. Now if you look at this population pyramid from UN projections, and for this example, I'm using the medium variant. Again, if you go down and click on the file, you can get all the variants in my analysis if you're a data nerd and want to play with it yourself. But in using that variant, one thing becomes quickly clear, and that is in the 15 to 29 year age groups, there's a huge demographic drop in that population. And that's the population that you would absolutely need to prosecute the war. So given that, things do look pretty dire for the Russians, but let's continue and see if that's truly the case. Let's take a look at the near term and see what that picture looks like. So if you look at the overall size of the Russian armed forces, there's about 850,000 total in that group. Additionally, there's another 200 to 250,000 Russian Federal National Guard troops. So you're looking at something on the order, a little, you know, a little over a million to 1.1 million, call it, in in avail, you know, in, in total troop capacity at the beginning of the conflict. That said, there's also 142,000 on the armed forces side, and between 33 and 48,000 on the Federal National Guard side that have already been committed to Ukraine. Additionally, there's another 33 to 43,000 troops that Russia has committed to other operations around the world, from Syria to Transnistria in Moldova, to Kyrgyzstan, to a number of other countries that they have security commitments to. So if you kind of adjust for all that, the Russians, at, you know, since the beginning of the war, had about a capacity of between 800 and 900,000 troops that they could potentially tap. That said, all those troops, at least on the armed forces side, are not all ground troops. Only about 372,000 of that 850,000 can be designated in that category. And in that category, what I am including is Russian airborne troops, Russian ground troops, Russian special operations forces, and naval infantry, kind of the Russian equivalent of Marines. Now, if I assume that the 142,000 that went into Ukraine is exclusively ground troops, which it's not, uh, it's not necessarily fair, but again, I've, I'm doing a fairly detailed analysis and I don't have all the data, but I'm gonna get relatively close because I'm doing it in enough granularity to, to make a difference. But if I assume there are 142,000, you know, it's kind of already out of the picture. And then I also assume, you know, so that gets you down to something roughly around 230,000 that you can really apply outside of 
the country in Ukraine. Additionally, you'd also have to take out that 33 to, to 43,000. So, you know, you're calling it around you know, 200,000 or so. So if I assume that roughly a third, you know, because 38% of that 372 went into, went into Ukraine. So I, the Russians don't have a lot of room to move around with in the intermediate term. So what I did is I just assumed that generously they can take 25 to 30% of that 800 to 900,000 that they have left and put it into the conflict at some point. And then what I did is I took the burn rates of, you know, from the 180 on the Russian side to 1,000 plus in the Ukrainian side and everything in between and just looked at the start date of the war, which is the 24th of February, to today's date, which is the 6th of August. And I just, you know, multiply by the, the number of days in between those periods. And if I take that out of that 800 to, to 900, it kind of gives you, um, and then, or, or if I take that number out of the 25% to 30% of the 800 to 900, that kind of gives you what the Russians have left to play with. And in the near term, it. I'm going to be honest, like you can see from the chart, it is incredibly dire. Even the Russians, which have the most optimistic estimate, would run out of troops in three and a half years. Now, if I look at the Ukrainian side, the, the, you know, that number implies they're going to run out of troops in a month. I don't think that's, you know, either one is realistic at all, but I think the U.S. numbers um, and the British numbers will kind of get you to uh, this, a sweet spot of between nine and 16 months where the Russians will run out of troops in order to prosecute the war. So is that true? Are the Russians really gonna culminate in as soon as nine months from now? Well, turns out that they have something up their sleeve. And those are three things. The first is the spring 2020 conscription. So that's another 134 and a half thousand troops that they can add to the mix in the intermediate term, call it nine to 12 months. So if they can get those soldiers trained, fitted, equipped, and sent to the fight in that period of time, they will have some buffer. Additionally, the Russians have about 2 million of reserve troops. They're not going to be you know, honed to a knife's edge, but that's still a ton of people. And then if they get really desperate, there's a, a little over 400,000 men in Russian prisons, at least Russian men, because there's also foreign men in Russian prisons. But you know, that's another source of troops that they can tap into. So if I add those into the mix, then the Russians can you know, do what they're doing for 42 years, at least at their estimate, before they run out of, run out of men. So that's, that's one area where you know, they, they might be okay. Now that said, on the Ukrainian side, if I take that over a thousand loss per day and extend it out into a very long period of time, even that number implies seven years. And that number is a ridiculous number. If you look at the British or, and US, i.e. Western estimates, you can get to something of between nine and uh, call it 15 years. So if the Russians are able to mobilize and get everything in place, Unfortunately, they're going to be just fine. But even with that range of outcomes, is there any possible way that the Russians could still run out of troops? Like, what if they do? What if something crazy happens and they quickly have to exhaust that supply of manpower? Well, let's see. So again, if you use UN estimates, the Russian population is about 145 million. 
and the number if you look at the age of potential fighting men the russians have eliminated the age at which you can ser serve so let's say i take an extremely liberal 18 to 65. so in that population there are about 45 million males now only about 37 of the million of them are in the labor force for whatever reason so let's just say the others aren't part of that now if i remove the armed forces and remove federal troops and all those other folks that would be part of the labor force and if i also remove all the forces that we've already thrown into the fight so and the reason you would remove them is because they'd be part of the labor force obviously so that count that, that includes the federal national guard troops the armed forces the spring 2020 cons conscripts and the two million folks who would have been called up i still have 34 million men in the population who can reasonably be recruited. So obviously you can't take all of them because your economy would fall apart. But even if I just took, I don't know, 10% of that, that's an additional 3.1 million. So at the end of the day, is Russia gonna run out of troops? Absolutely not. Now, is it gonna be hard? Is it gonna be rough over the next nine months? Absolutely. And if they don't get their act together, they're really gonna struggle. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news for folks who are cheering Crane on, and I count myself among them, but from a very hard analytical standpoint, Russia running out of troops, while on a qualitative standpoint, you know, could cause civil unrest and a lot of qualitative factors. From a very quantitative analytical standpoint, it's not going to be an issue for you know in the intermediate to long term. So with that, I invite you to like and subscribe if you found this valuable. Also, if you want to play around with the numbers that I came up with, I'm selling the Excel analysis that I put together at an extreme discount, 90% discount. So if you're again, if you're a data nerd, if you're just a follower of the, the show and enjoy my content, you know, do not do not buy it. Do not buy it. But if you really want to dig in and also like debate, debate me, right? I could I could have made many mistakes in this analysis. Like tell me where I'm wrong in the comments. I want to know because this is a moving target. I did this relatively quickly with the available data and data always changes and we all make mistakes. So I definitely welcome a lively discussion and debate in the comments. So have a great day and I will see you soon. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.